All right, y'all know the deal. I take fashion questions from Instagram and then I answer them. Here we go. Are all brand collaborations boring? Yes, but it's more complicated than that. Also, shouts out uh, Sneakers Anime. That is that is the homie. And I am still waiting for the EV sneakers, the, the EV Nikes. <laughs> the way that I'll overly simplify it for the sake of this episode is that if, if a collaboration between two brands is newsworthy enough that it's showing up on your timeline, then yes, it's probably no good. The, but the reality of, of that is that like, like Junya Watanabe, for example, this season, this is how many collaborations Junya did just in this one season. Okay, so none of those made it to your timeline. There were a few people, I think um, Style.com was like, this is how many collaborations Junya did. Wow, isn't that a lot? And so like the quantity of collaborations was like kind of funny and some people used it as a meme. But none of those collaborations individually were like, you know, like on Hypebeast being like, welcome to a new world. It's time for Junya Watanabe and Eastpac. Because ultimately at the end of the day, what collaborations are supposed to be is two businesses looking at each other and saying, hey, I do this thing really well, you do this thing really well, let's work together and see if we can make something that is new or at least relatively special. And good stuff like that comes out all the time. I mean, for example, the pants that I'm wearing are a collaboration between Shinya Kazuka and Dickies. That's not a collaboration that was making it to your timeline as some kind of newsworthy piece, but I mean, Dickies, they, they actually, I think they own the textile that they make all of the workwear out of. It's this like special combination of cotton and a certain kind of polyester that makes it where it's mega resistant to oil and it ages in this really specific, beautiful way. I've beaten the ever-loving shit out of these pants and they still just look incredible because they're cut in this really crazy way that Shinya was able to bring to Dickies. This is a great collaboration. This came out maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And I mean, nobody saw it on their timeline as some like crazy event, but it was a really good collaboration and it's not boring at all. This is exactly what I want those collaborations to be. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting really tired of, um, you know, I mean, everyone I think had a big moment of disillusion with the Nike and Tiffany's thing. I think the public started to universally question whether or not this had gone too far. Next question. Why do you think high fashion hasn't explored many different views on masculinity? That is such a good question. We talked about that a little bit recently in the episode that I did about shoulders. But yeah, basically we talked about how women's wear sort of adopted these things from men's wear, but then they grew them out in their own way. Shoulders are a great example of that, where even the, the really exaggerated power shoulders of women didn't really look the same as men's power shoulders. But fashion for its whole history really has approached masculinity in a very one dimensional way. I mean, fashion is really, really interested in the like hairless, extremely skinny, tall, super chiseled, but kind of small facial features. And so, I mean, like to your question, why do you think high fashion hasn't explored many different views of masculinity? I think for runway shows, I think they would just use the same excuse. If they were ever called to task about this, they would just use the same excuse that they've used for women models, which is like, oh, well, the clothes are in a sample size. And so we need sample size models to just fit the clothes. It's just easier that way. And unfortunately, the easiest solution is not always the one that we need to be doing. There are so many people who are not just like skinny and tall who look incredible in some of these clothes. I mean, it really doesn't take much time of being in a fashion community for you to realize that it's like, wow, like everybody has the ability to wear stuff beautifully and to look great in it. And then often the different body types reveal things about proportion and the way that like color can be moved along a body and the way that things skim over you. It, it brings out a lot of things in the clothes that you wouldn't be able to see if it was all just one type of body wearing it. And while those revelations, at least to me, are very clear that all different kinds of bodies can look great in all different kinds of clothes, that often is not the reality for those people themselves. Anyone who is above a certain very reasonable size would tell you that it's like, oh yeah, it is extremely hard to find clothes. And it's shitty. I mean, it, it really does not cost them much more just to make the stuff in a, you know, one or two sizes bigger, but they they choose not to. I have, I have no idea. I have no good answers for you as to why. I have no idea why that is. It, it seems to me, that seems like money that's just being left on the table. Anyway. Why are you not at Pity Womo, but just Fashion Weeks? Not just Fashion Weeks, it's pretty much just Paris Fashion Week and Berlin Fashion Week. That that video is crazy, by the way. If you haven't seen that, it's great. Um, I mean, the, the reality is that I am an independent journalist and the budget can only go so far, um, which, I mean, hey, not to seg too hard. I promise a real person asked that question, but 
uh, that does sag into the Patreon pretty well. Gosh, just recently we uploaded a three hour conversation with the guy who runs the largest Helmet Lang archive in the world. Like it's bigger than Helmet Lang's archive. Oh my. Oh wow. And he talked to us for three hours. And at the end of the three hours, he was ready to keep going. But yeah, I mean, that that will make it to the public version in some small, like, I mean, 12 minute episode or something. But the, the full three hour conversation, he has just infinite insights cascading into more insights that, you know, I just, I can't include all of it in the public version, but it's on the Patreon. If you like this stuff, if you feel like you learn a lot and you want to support it, we have a really cheap student tier that you can sign up for. You get a lot of benefits. There's a lot of exclusive episodes, but the, the budget right now can only sustain Paris Fashion Week. So that's, that's where we go. Hopefully as more people join, we'll get to add more stuff to the schedule. But for now, that's what it is. I would love to go to Pity, by the way. Pity is incredible. I love the way that Pity sets up their stuff. Where is their information about how many units of a certain piece there are in the world? Okay, so I've wondered this a whole bunch myself. There is no dependable way to get a real answer on that. If you, you know, Google around, you like ask someone who works in manufacturing or something, they could give you an estimate for something. But if you're like saying like, how many of this jacket did Gucci make? There is no way for you to get that information. Someone please correct me if I am wrong about this in the comments, but I have looked for this information on and off for a few years. I've never been able to find a dependable answer to it. And I think that brands, much like their like annual income, brands don't, they're motivated to not report that data. Great question, I wish I had an answer for you. What in your opinion is the best example of integrating image slash illustration slash photos into clothing? Examples would be like Yoji Yamamoto's 1991 fall portraits on jackets, Vivian Westwood and Marlene Dietrich. Well, first of all, those are two really great examples of this. I have a personal affinity for the way that Jun Takahashi uses graphics. So there's stuff that dates back to uh, him doing 2001 A Space Odyssey See, there was the, the really recent motif of the, the hand back in, I think, 2015, maybe. And that was just printed on to certain pieces. But then the hand got redone recently, which we featured on the channel here when I went to Paris last. And they redid it with this incredible texture. So it wasn't just like screen printed on there. It, it was absolutely beautiful. And then, of course, there's stuff like the Undercover Black collection. Jun Takahashi is masterful with graphics, in my opinion. I also unpopular opinion, probably. I've always been a big fan of Supreme's approach to graphics. Boo, Bliss, you suck. This one especially, and this one especially, are two of my, um, maybe, maybe it's the wording that I really like on this one. This kind of struck me the same way that like, E.E. E. Cummings poetry kind of strikes me, where it's just sort of like, it seems disjointed and stuff in the way that it's written, but it, it feels like there's like a, an interpretation you can pull out of it with like a feeling rather than just like a going word by word understanding what each word means. I've always really liked that shirt. And then of course the uh, the use of classical painting in this shirt that I cannot show you or I will get demonetized. <laughs> Comment if you know the name of that shirt for real. I'm, I'm curious if anybody actually knows what it is. I've always also thought that um, Loewe was pretty good with graphics and imagery on shirts. Next question. Does fashion need to make a statement to be considered good in today's industry? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think so. Um, I know that on this channel, we tend to focus very deeply on brands that are making some kind of statement or are delivering a message, building a narrative, building some kind of world for the brand. And I mean, part of that is just because that's what my taste is as a fashion critic. Even if I tried super hard to just be like complete, like robotically objective about everything, I'm not really able to do that. I The, the stuff that is preferential to me personally is going to tend to float up to the top even if I'm really trying to keep that stuff down. And I do, by the way. I, I try really hard for this channel to not just be full of stuff that is just my little subjective opinion and I'm just kind of like, yes to this, no to that. Because like, why would you show up if I was doing that? I try to be objective. I try to feature designers and collections that I've selected based on their merit rather than me just saying, ooh, I like that. But even still, that's not even really what your question is. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, does fashion need to be making a statement to be considered good in today's industry? No, I mean, there are lots of brands that are just making really high quality clothes that are excellent at what they do. Great example of that is Xenia. I'm a huge fan of Xenia. I've been fortunate enough to find a couple of pieces by them secondhand that are just incredibly high quality. I have a cashmere coat from them that I 
found for $175. Tag still attached, unbelievable. Another great example of that is The Row. And I mean, both of those companies are doing great. And they, they really just focus on, we make very high quality clothes. And they're great at what they do. This is a great one. Who is the greatest engineer of fashion of all time and why is it or is it not Issey Miyake? Issey is a pretty good example of that. Um, there's been a lot of really good fashion engineers and of course all fashion design is engineering on some level where you're you know, engineering something by cutting the pattern and grading the, the pattern for different sizes and stuff. All of it is engineering. But the people, I know what you mean, it's like advanced engineering. Issei is a great example of that. If you want more details about that, I went into them in a recent episode where I talked about Issei's passing, the history of his work, and how that history and the technique is being continued under the current creative director, Satoshi Kondo. Other people that I would submit are Iris Van Herpen, where you look at her stuff and it oftentimes looks like it should be physically impossible for it to even happen. She's often inventing techniques for the textiles and the, the way that clothes can be constructed. She's inventing completely new techniques for every season, which is why when she shows twice a year, there's only 15, 17 looks per collection. Or in the case of a recent COVID collection where there were huge constraints on her work, there was one look. Another name that kind of has to get mentioned for this is Hussein Shalayan. Uh, unbelievably advanced stuff that was happening, especially in the runway shows. All these little experiments and all these kind of just like proving that you can do certain things with fashion, that was all very fun. Great like advanced engineer of clothing. Kind of a left field submission for this might be Noir Kai Ninomiya, where uh, there's a consistent rule for their runway pieces that the clothes cannot be stitched together. And so they have to find other alternatives, whether that's like chain linking the, the pieces together or melting the seams together or finding alternatives, kind of reimagining what a seam is. But yeah, all of those little kick flips that they've done to accomplish the goal within that constraint, Noir Kai is, is definitely a strong submission for best engineer. What's that thing at the end of a arm tapestry where it rolls on itself backwards to the midline? Oh, this question was submitted by Isaac. <laughs> He's smart ass. What was your most emotional reaction to fashion in the last year? Um, so, I mean, in the last year, I have been going to Paris runway shows for the first time. And so that kind of brought about a lot of very intense reactions to me. <laughs> Probably the thing that stood out to me the most in the most unexpected way was this specific look from Awake Mode. I specified in my review of Paris Fashion Week that season that I was going into this show and I was very tired. It was the end of the week. This was the first show of the day. I was really groggy. I was not ready to be suspended in the dream of fashion when I walked in there, but this dress really just the combination of that color with that textile and that cut um, and in, in the review, I specified that none of those three things on their own were particularly wild or nothing, nothing new really. But those three things in combination with each other became more than the sum of their parts. This dress really blew me away. I love that dress. When I went to my first Rick Owens show, I've said a lot on the channel that Rick is, uh, if, if I was being totally subjective and just talking about my own preferences, Rick is, Rick is number one. I was at a show, I was in the room and it was happening. The fog was filling up the room. You kind of can't tell from the video. The fog was very thick and it made it where the models when they were coming from the other end of the room, they sort of appeared as like a vague shadow. And then it was like, a, all you could see was a silhouette with no color or any features. And then they would kind of emerge out of the fog as they got closer to you and you got surprised by the color and the texture. And um, I cried a whole bunch in that show. I imagine that the other people in standing room was like, what is wrong with this dude next to me? What is happening? It was really moving. Getting to, getting to see any runway show in person is a pretty special experience. And um, yeah, getting to see my favorite one was, uh, that was really moving for me. That's it. I love you all with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns. Go join that Patreon. You're all the best.